we're in business. Um, there won't be too many politically incorrect jokes. Do you want a sexist one, a racist one, or an anti-psychologist one? Anti-psychologist. Anti-psychologist, okay. Yes, yeah, probably safer too. <coughs> I'm a psychologist by background. Behavioural psychologists um, believe, uh, despite the word psyche means mind, you can only study behaviour, not mind, okay? So two psychologists, man, male and woman, man, man and woman, nothing queer about psychologists, uh, make love together, and one turns to the other and says, that was great for you, how was it for me? There you go. More as we go along, possibly. So this is my... Um, <coughs> I thought, and by the way, do do interrupt for clarification or comments as we go on, and I'll try and the time. Um, uh, in two parts. <coughs> the end of, of leadership, as we've known it, is part of my argument, and then an optimistic view of a possible, possible future. Um, uh, <coughs> this is just the, um, the headings, I think. Uh, I'll say something as we go along. So leadership, I think, is a high-profile thing. has had about a 15, 20-year run. Um, uh, and I'm going to argue that's come to an end, but that's not obvious at the moment. So it has at least a high-profile thing. I'm not talking about leadership totally disappearing, but the fundamental change. It existed before um, <coughs> before the Industrial Revolution. Um, I may say this later. Uh, management came in with the Industrial Revolution just down the road with the cotton mills in Lancashire when the, when the chap, when he was a chap, uh, set up the cotton mill. He either went off to some start up another cotton mill or built a country house in Cheshire next door to Cali Cooper and took up hunting, shooting and fishing like you do. Uh, but in either case, he appointed somebody called a managing agent to, to run the, 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 the mill he had set up. So that's the first use of the word management. Um, and the word management comes from the French word for manage, manage, which is for housework, and the Italian word manageore, which is war horses, because it's got a hard and soft uh, version. And my colleague David Weir said there's an Arab version, which is closer to the Italian one. Uh, Some cause of Parkinson's law. I'll do this one out. Any of you old enough to remember Parkinson's law? Can you tell me what it is? Yeah, you must all be very young. Uh, it, it's uh, work expands to fill the space that allocated to it. Probably as true today as it was. Now uh, you're talking largely about the civil service and the like. Uh, but that's not the main one. Interesting. There's a subsidiary one, which says when an activity moves from a port cabin on the edge of the industrial site to a brand new building near the centre, uh, it's approaching the end of its sell by date. <laughs> <laughs> and you've just been sitting in a 10 million pound tin hut called the Leadership Centre. Uh, and that's not the only one by any means. Uh, most of the companies have kind of leadership centres these days. I went to the launch of the Leadership Foundation for Higher Education at the Old Work Foundation offices in Westminster. And Gordon Brown, on those came, came when he was um, comes to Exchequer or whatever it is. And he was quite funny, he got close up. He made a joke. He said, Well, there seems to be a leadership centre for every part of the public sector. And he thought, he said, Except senior politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a dig at Tony Blair. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Keith Grint, who used to be with us, um, has a theory which I think is right, but there's a pendulum that swings between what he calls human relations and scientific management. Human relations is the soft stuff, and scientific management is you know, the harder stuff. <coughs> um, and I think that's true, and I'm going to use that. <coughs> um, I think it was a fairly convincing argument that leadership, in the soft sense, all the wonderful mission, vision, empowerment, vision statement stuff, not done against that, <coughs> caused the credit crunch because they were so focused on that that they missed the analytics of the, if you like, the rotten apples, you remember in the subprime mortgage packages, boxes of apples were, shipped, were sold as, you know, as fresh and new and perfect, um, for there were rotten apples in which uh, the rest. And I did this presentation at the Charlton Institute Personal Development Conference in Manchester last November. <coughs> and, and on the panel with me was um, the Director of Human Resources for the Royal Bank of Scotland. And he actually said, John, it's worse than that. <coughs> We've got shed loads of analysts who did the analytics. Uh, and what was in there, we, we knew exactly, you know, to the nth degree. 
um, what was in the boxes. We just bloody ignored it. So, <laughs> so my argument is that, that uh, <coughs> leadership is too much of the soft form and not enough of the, of the hard form got us in trouble. <coughs> I, I'm, not, I, you know, I'm in favour of both. Um, in a way, the right mix. So you need the machine and you need oil to make the machine work. Um, and Will Pollard here is kind of in, into policy, and I think one of the reasons why the sort of quality movement is a great survivor as a change recipe is that it combines both. It's got sort of statistical process control and Kaizen, which is the tough stuff, the analytic stuff, scientific stuff, and um, uh, <coughs> the soft stuff in Kaizen and quality circles and the stuff. So actually, I think it definitely does what you should do, which is uh, does both things like the machine and the oil to make it work. Um, and in the NHS, there must be people in the NHS here, is there? Oh, look, hi, hi there. Uh, I, I've done loads of stuff with the NHS. And we used to work for the National Health Leadership Centre in Belgrave Road, which was then absorbed, they did quite a lot of leadership development, and we did evaluation of it. And that was absorbed into the NHS III, National Institute for Innovation and Improvement on the Warwick campus. And there, they, they didn't do away with leadership development entirely, but they went more um, more of a short-term system improvement, particularly Six Sigma. I know I still understand why Six Sigma. There must be a reason. Um, but it's uh, <coughs> it's more local. It's quicker to implement. So you, you know you take the kind of the press or you know the blood sample gets taken, it goes off the path lab, it comes back to the doctor, and you can improve that um, that ch that chain, whatever you call it. <coughs> so it's you know cheaper, quicker to implement quicker to have an impact, quicker to evaluate and prove its value for money. So I see that um, that swing in the NHS amongst other places. We had a mammal student who analysed the um, market for consultants. Perhaps not surprisingly, the soft stuff was in decline, but the tougher stuff, the more scientific stuff, was at least uh, keeping going. And I think McKinsey's have got put several million pounds into a new analytics centre. So I think it's, it's happening <coughs> under our noses. Um, uh, <coughs> there's a lot of talk about distributed leadership, um, which can it can work, and but I can think of a disastrous example, but it doesn't. My colleague David Collinson has coined the phrase blended leadership, which is a mix of heroic and um, <coughs> and distributed. And uh, <coughs> in the FE sector, but I think it works in universities or any professional organisation. So people like the the, the the autonomy and freedom uh, <coughs> of empowerment and delegation and stuff. By the end of the day, they like some to decide where the goalposts are and how they're shifting. So that's that's the blend. And I think that, that works quite well. Um, uh, <coughs> I might skip over this, but one, one of the trends, well, I find too much. Virtual leadership, as, as you know, quite a lot of work is turning virtual. You sit at your lap laptop in Starbucks or cross street, because they have static copy, it might be. And so, you know, with a laptop, a mobile phone, a dongle, Wi Fi access, you can run a business from virtually anywhere or your back bedroom or whatever. <coughs> if you're in a corporate setting, you can you still sort of email the person sitting in the next workstation to you rather than talk to them or work from home, it doesn't matter where you are. You have shared databases and externally, if like uh, say Amazon, you relate to your customers um, largely virtually but also your suppliers. I remember Lego UK moved, when toys moved from corner shops to Toys R Us. Uh, <coughs> But everything was plugged in, they restocked, they, they agreed where it was going to be displayed in Toys R Us, which is critical. Uh, they just plug in their point of sales tools to their stock control, automatically top up the stuff and the invoices go out. That's a virtual sort of um, supplier relationship. And the education research is a little correspondence theory. It says social conditions, so educational practice mirrors social conditions, more in the process sense. So the Victorian <coughs> schoolroom is a classic example, rows of rows of desks, teacher at the front, then the clerks in the factory, rows of clerks, supervisor at the front, and the equivalent on the shop floor. So what's happening with virtual um, uh, <coughs> virtual work, virtual leadership? At the moment, I think it's, it's just sort of leadership as we've known it by, by another medium. But the, you probably named Shazana Zubov at Harvard, wrote a book called In the Age of the Smart Machine, said that first when we get IT, we automate, you know, put the payroll, etc., on the computer. But later on, we informate, we saturate organisations with it. And I think at the moment we're um, uh, just doing 
traditional leadership but to another medium. But quite soon somebody's going to find a new form of leadership that fits them and you know, for you there's kind of money to be made to consultants, whoever gets there first or spots it first. Uh, <coughs> a virtuous leadership is just to play on words there. Well this is a kind of Enron, etc. avoiding the corporate scandals. <coughs> Some of which, you know, deliberately or by accident, are about ignoring the analytics. Uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, or I think Enron, and what's the school buses in there or something? I can't remember the details of it. I don't know if it was. <coughs> but I mean, also this kind of lack of moral confidence, <coughs> which is one of the instrumental stuff. Uh, I think an ephemeralised leadership. Ephemeralisation comes from something called Buckminster Fuller. Anybody heard of him? He invented the Geard Geese. Geodesic dome, that little triangles of glass or plywood, that's the most efficient way of containing the space. And he also points out we still build our houses basically by piling up stones and putting branches across the top. My house is like that. This building is kind of like that, except it's got tin on top, up the side. Um, and it doesn't. But it's doing more with less. So when I was young, a radio was this big and it had a car battery type thing there and a little battery on the other side. And it was fairly creaky. But now you can get a radio that's no bigger than my watch. It's much smaller, better, much more efficient, blah, blah, blah. So that's ephemeralization. And obviously in these times of uh, the desire for leanness and the like, that's a, a big sell out of that market. Um, and uh, <coughs> Mary Parker Follett is being rediscovered these days. Early writer on leadership books about the law of the situation, which is if you're aware of it and sensitive to it enough, the situation will tell you what to do. A bit like philosophical pragmatism in the uh, American sense, Dewey, Saunders, and Pierce, which Dewey is the interesting one because he was the educational philosopher, stroke psychologist, who Cole attributes to the basic idea of experiential learning in the cycle, which I know you can be critical of. <coughs> and this relates to learning organization stuff. So, learning organization, at least in my view, is not anti hierarchy, which a lot of people think it is, but what it says is the people at the top need to listen to the data coming up. <coughs> as much as telling people what to do and then use their sort of helicopter view to see the big picture and suggest what, what people do. So obviously it doesn't work like that. I remember my wife too him quote from the BBC with Sally and others and, and Joe. I mm -hmm. think there was a little focus group on what's wrong from the BBC at the bottom. It was a quite serious problem with bullying and the like, you know, it came up. But it went it was edited up the system and kind of uh, cleansed. So when it got to the to the what is it, control of the board as they're called. Yeah. This gang, Mark Thompson, you still there? Just about. Uh, um, it was oh, everything's pretty fine, chaps. There's a few, few problems with the candy, you know. <laughs> the chips are overcooked or something. <laughs> so if, if 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 senior leaders are getting distorted information, they can't they take an intelligent view about what's going on, they give a sensible direction. So uh, that all comes from uh, uh, Mary Parker Follett, I said. So, yeah, sorry, I've talked about this. So, human, human relations back to scientific management. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, but it's just going to the same ones. Uh, <coughs> you, some of you will know that um, Lancaster's taken over the Work Foundation, it used to be Industrial Society, posh place in London, Westminster. Will Hutton, up to recently, has been the boss, and he's 